My name is Huli, and I am honored to be here at Product Camp and tell you a, a few lessons that I've learned, some the easy way, some the hard way, with uh, working with our soldiers. To begin, though, I wanted to thank our sponsors, and most specifically, I don't have the updated slides, so I need to give a personal shout out to 280 Group, which is the group that I worked with to get my certification as a product manager changed my life. So uh, find Tom if you need him. Highly, highly recommend. All right. We got to start at the beginning, right? I'm going to talk to you about a couple of premises that we want to start with, and then we're going to go through the principles of the Army Software Factory and how I've discovered those actually apply in the real world. Uh, I did not necessarily know there was going to be a connection, so that was a pleasant surprise. So many of us say when we teach that we learn more from teaching than uh, the students do, and that's absolutely been the case for me. When I found out that I was going to be teaching active duty soldiers, uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, I got this. And inside, I was thinking it was going to be like this. I was perfectly ready to walk into a room of white alpha males screaming at me and challenging my authority at every turn. So I was prepared. Luckily, however, somebody taught me once that you have a choice every day. As you walk into a room, you walk into a new adventure, you can face it like this or you can face it like this. And so I made a conscious decision, and boy, did it take some talking to myself. But to go into that first meeting, that first design sprint with a bunch of soldiers and scientists and three stars, and not be like this, not be ready to defend myself, but to be open to the journey and see what the adventure was. And I was delighted to find out in my very first meeting that they did not want to talk during the breaks about uh, violent things that they had done in their past. What they wanted to talk about, you guys, was their dogs. <laughs> That's what they wanted to talk about. One of the guys had a painting leaning up against his desk of his, his dog in, in a full dress military uniform, beautiful oil painting. And everything changed. From there, I've got pictures that I can't share with you, unfortunately, but we have a chief happiness officer at the Army Software Factory, and one of the things she did uh, last summer was she brought in a bunch of kittens from Austin Pets Alive, and if you have ever seen guys with, I mean, they've got biceps as big as me holding kittens, it's awesome. So that was the world I found myself in. It wasn't the world I expected. I had a bunch of mental models already set up. I had a lot of programming already installed. So my invitation to you as you begin your work with your constituents, whoever they may be, whether or not they're soldiers, whether it's a high risk, high stress battlefield, or it's more of a metaphorical uh, people upset about toner in the copier battlefield, consider the possibility that your view is distorted. Consider the possibility that your biggest opportunity before you start your conversations is to take a step back and reset to neutral. Uh, I was a fundraiser for many years, and there were a lot of people in that line of work who thought rich people need to give other people money. And that model is not helpful. The model that was helpful is this is an equitable exchange. I am giving this wealthy person the opportunity to transform something in the world that doesn't feel right to them and do something extraordinary. Do you see the shift? So if we have the opportunity as product managers, as, as leaders, as designers, whatever role it is we play in the organization, to hit reset in ourselves and meet people where they are, chances are we're going to have a much more direct line to success. 
The other step that was really important for me to understand as I began working with this team was their vision. And their vision, as, as declared up here, is by soldiers for soldiers. The idea behind the software factory was that consultants are great. No offense to anybody in here who may be a consultant. You're badass, you're amazing. And also true that if you are solving problems for a literal battlefield, if you are solving problems for how a cockpit is laid out in a helicopter, who better than to get somebody with domain expertise as a part of the leadership in that conversation, not just a user that you may interview along the way, but somebody who is embedded literally in solving that problem. So they created the software factory. Their hope was that it would deliver on these three things. First, that it would be responding to a changing world, right? Technology, you've, you've heard lessons on AI, you've heard lessons on different kinds of thinking that you need to bring to bear to make sure your company stays in the forefront. And that's something the Army has to think about, just like any other company. They also wanted to make sure that they were providing uh, enabling and broadening opportunities to the people in the organization. And that is something that you're probably encountering yourselves as you're working with teams. Maybe you're leading a design sprint and you've got some more junior members of the staff in the room. You have an opportunity to give them that broadening opportunity, that enabling opportunity, that ability to, to take game thinking back into their office and say, you wouldn't believe this cool thing I learned. I'm not sure how to apply it, but can we experiment? with it, and that's part of what they wanted to model. And the last, of course, was retention and a satisfaction. Uh, any of us who work in the tech industry know what a sensitive topic this is right now and how fraught it is. And so this was a commitment that they wanted to make organization-wide, that they were providing uh, motivation for people to stay on board, to stay in-house. So the lesson that we learned from that uh, at least that I learned from that, was uh, something, it's a quote I actually have taped to the phone in my classroom. Plans are useless, but planning is essential. So often, it's not about the artifact that we're delivering, it's about what was the conversation we had on the way to that artifact. Not necessarily what, what happened when we made that decision about the, the corner radius of that button, but what conversation did we have at the pizza lunch, right, about our kids that, that led us to that solution? So this is where we started. And the software factory has five key principles. They've got it on huge banners, floor to ceiling banners. It's all over the place. We have TV screens where these five principles are shown in rotation every day with a lot of other materials. And I wanted to share this with you because they unexpectedly for me at least, connected with some of the principles that I've discovered in my career. Uh, oh, sorry, back to one more point about that slide, knowing your destination. Anybody familiar with the five whys? You've used this as a technique to get down to root causes, right? And second and third order effects. One of the most powerful conversations I had with my students was my first cohort, sitting down with the young man who was a captain at the time, uh, product manager to be, and I asked him why he had signed up for the software factory. And you know, you, you get these quite, why do you have this job? How'd you get interested in this? It's thing, I wanted stability for my family. I wanted to provide. I thought Austin would be a great place to raise my kids, right? But what's underneath that? And what's underneath that? And what's underneath that? Why is that important? And talking to this young man, we got to his why, and his why, was to bring everybody home. Man, I mean, I, I get goosebumps just, just saying that and remembering his face. So when we start to drift, when we start to argue about the copier, and we start to argue about uh, uh, that design system is ridiculous, who signed off on that color of gold? When we start to have those arguments, uh, the finding about those constraints are stupid, why do we even have to respect those, why can't we just innovate? Uh, it helps to say, well, is, is that conversation, is that data point, is that opinion something that's gonna bring somebody home? And if it's not, how much more time do we really wanna spend on it? Right, so know your destination when you go forward. 
here, here are the five principles. The first one, in their words, is soldier-centered. And in the software factory, what that means is rank agnostic. We want to make sure that if we have an enlisted soldier, if we have a specialist who is friggin' brilliant, we do not want that person to feel as though they can't speak up because there is a major in the room. We don't want that person to feel as though they, they have to calibrate their message because uh, somebody is up for a promotion to colonel next month. So our soldiers come in in civilians, uh, in civilian clothes. They call each other by their first name. They can sit by whoever they want. Uh, my husband was in the Air Force, and he still thinks this is remarkable that, that a captain can talk to a colonel without anybody second-guessing it or raising an eyebrow. So how does this apply when you think about the work you're doing in your boardrooms, in your stakeholder conversations? The fact is you already have realized this. You can't see power on an org chart. And even in the military, we can't see power just by the stripes on the uniform. That's an indicator, but it doesn't tell you who the opinion leaders are. It doesn't tell you who people look to for advice about what, uh, what school is a great school for their kids, and they make those bonds, and they form those relationships. So if you have the opportunity, maybe instead of being soldier-centered in your work, you have the opportunity to be human-centered or person-centered. And think about the individuals that you're working with, not necessarily this is the CEO and that's the marketing person, and they have, the, they have this authority, and they're responsible for these line items on the budget. Can you find the power that's not reflected on the org chart? Show that curiosity. Get to know those people. What that leads to is being inclusive. We have a, a woman in our cohort right now. She's about my age, African-American. She came up through a much different uh, lived experience than a lot of other people who are in the classroom. And my biggest opportunity with her is to stay out of the way so that she can share her lived experience and talk about what's going on. We're having a conversation a couple of weeks ago about um, something that was going to be uh, happening in the UK. It was a, an alert that was going to go out, a uh, test of an alert system for uh, natural disasters. And what they had discovered is they hadn't taken into account those people, a lot of them women, who have second phones, who have hidden phones because they're in an abusive relationship or they're in a dangerous situation and they need to have that other device that maybe their partner doesn't know about. And what happens if that phone rings? What happens to that person? That wasn't, there was no malice there, it was an unintended consequence. But because she was in the classroom, she was able to raise that issue. And I, I can tell you, there were all kinds of raised eyebrows all over that room going, I don't understand, why doesn't she just leave? And so, of course, we have an opportunity in 2023 to have a, a useful off-tangent conversation. But that's what I mean by being inclusive and keeping your mind open to different experiences because that's sometimes where the innovation will come from is somewhere completely unexpected. We have two helicopter pilots. One is 6'4", 6'5", one is about 5'7". They've got wildly different opinions about that lever in the helicopter and how, whether they can reach it or not. And these are important conversations as we talk about design choices. But you didn't see this coming. This is one of the five key principles of the US Army Futures Command software factory default to empathy and kindness. This is always our starting point, which makes my life easier when I'm teaching designers. But it's also fantastic as a place to go back to. Somebody have to miss class? Default to empathy and kindness. I don't care what your grade is. I want to know, did you learn what we were teaching? If it takes you three bites at the apple, I don't care. I'm just going to keep the highest score. We keep the conversation going until you master it, because the reason you're here is not to get a good grade. The reason that you're here is to learn 
and feel confident and be able to go onto the floor and contribute in a meaningful way that you're proud of at the end of the day. And that is true for everybody that you're working with. They all want to make some change in the world. They all want to make a contribution. It may not look like your contribution. That's OK. That's why there's all of us. It takes all kinds to fill the freeways. So. This was uh, completely charming to me uh, when I saw this during my first visit to campus. Uh, I thought, I'm, I'm done. They're never going to get me out of here. Look how beautiful is this. So the lesson I would hope that you could take from this and bring back to wherever you're going is that your compassion can be a superpower. It is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of connection. It is a sign of humanity. It is a way for you, no matter what your role is, to advocate for someone else, whether it's your user, your stakeholder, your boss, um, the software dev who couldn't be in the room and you know they're having a real issue trying to get this through. Use your opportunity to influence in a way that makes your organization better and stronger. It's just a glorious way to, to be of service, whatever your philosophy may be about the world. Bringing that compassion to bear is, is extraordinary, and it changes your organization. Three more principles. The third is trust and transparency in all we do. Now, this is hard, as you might imagine, in an organization where uh, information is often classified. And there are all kinds of NDAs that you have to sign. And you can't share everything you want to. But what you can do is establish a culture of trust where people believe that the leadership has their best interests at heart. If they could share the information, they would share the information. And one of the things that, that they do at the software factory is share a lot of information that people may not think is necessarily that important, but it fills up that tank of trust. So that when people have to make that leap and say they're not telling us something, they've got all this evidence that they've already amassed that says these people have open doors, open minds, open eyes, open ears, and they're talking to us and sharing all this information. I had some students who had to go all the way up to a full bird kernel to ask permission to send out a, a user survey. And they were terrified. They were terrified. But they got in there, and they came back to the classroom, and they said, uh, first of all, uh, we call him Jason. We can call him Jason. And he really listened to us. He actually uh, asked us questions about what we wanted and what we were trying to accomplish. That is going to buy him so much goodwill downstream when he says, I can't tell you about what's happening with this unit. Uh, we don't know yet. But as soon as that information is available, I will share it with you. And they will trust that he will do that. And that gives him room as a leader to maneuver. If you have the opportunity to do that in your sprints, in your workshops, in your IPMs, if you have the opportunity to model that for the people on your team, that you are sharing everything you can and being as transparent as possible, you are making down payments on those future favors you're going to need to ask where you say, I, I don't know if we have a budget for that yet. I don't, I don't know if, we have, if we've gotten that uh, position approved. But what I can tell you is as soon as I find out, I'm going to pass that information on. And modeling that behavior is uh, extraordinarily powerful. Uh, be visible is the second piece I put here. And that's based on another experience I had. I was overseeing a software conversion. Actually, it was barely even a software conversion. It was like a paper and software conversion. And people did not understand what it was. They didn't understand why it was going to cost that much. They didn't understand what these people were doing in this room. So we found what we called a war room. And it happened to be a fishbowl with three sides that was on a major hallway in the organization. And that meant any time you were walking down the hall, you saw that there were a bunch of people working in this room. You saw that there were, there were post-its and uh, 
sketches and diagrams and things up on the wall. You saw people talking to each other. You saw people looking over each other's shoulder at computers. And that transparency, literal transparency, without us even saying a word to our colleagues, helped build that credibility. Helped show that we could be trusted. Nothing we were doing was secret. Maybe they couldn't tell. Maybe they couldn't read the writing on the charts that we had up. But it wasn't mysterious. It wasn't happening in a black box. It wasn't a secret that only super smart people got to know about. It was something anybody could look in that window and learn about. So if you are doing that kind of work and you're finding that there's tension in your organization, people are saying, well, they've had these meetings and we never know what's going on. Maybe you can't tell them, but consider where you're having the meeting. Consider what you're doing with the artifacts afterward. Can you hang some of these giant post-its with post-its on them in the hallway for people to actually read as they walk by if they're so inclined or just see, boy, they're doing a lot with sticky notes and that, that department, I don't know what it is, but there's sure a lot of work going on. Those small indicators can, can transform the culture of your organization. And in fact, I've had our colonel come to me and say, look, um, General so-and-so is coming to campus. Do you have anything you can do with the, some post-its? Uh, uh, well, the class just started. We haven't gotten to that level, but, but sure, I'll do a workshop. And we do an affinity mapping workshop about uh, how, how would we come up with the ideal Thanksgiving dinner for this group. And we get a section, we, you know, we get a cluster of dessert, and we get a cluster of football. That's okay. He's seeing the process, and he's sharing the process, and he's proud of the process that we're going through, which is a big deal. Okay, two more principles. Uh, fourth principle, now this makes sense if you're dealing with a military group, right? Embody grit and resiliency. We're tough. Nothing's going to get us down. If someone tells us to take that hill, we're going to take that goddamn hill. It doesn't need to be quite that intense in your organizations, but the opportunity for the invitation here is iteration. So much of the first couple of weeks of working with these soldiers is saying, you don't have to get it right the first time. They don't, they don't even know what that is. You don't have to get it right the first time. We're gonna do it, we're gonna see what happens, we're gonna get some feedback, we're gonna get some data, we're gonna iterate, we're gonna try it again, see if we do any better. And we're gonna keep doing it probably forever. Uh, and that's okay, that's okay. Those things are not scarring us, they're not marking us, they're not wounding us, they're not, they're not keeping us from reaching our full potential. They're opening a door to an area that deserves more attention. They're giving us an opportunity to explore something new. And that's the way that we try to frame it, that it's not about uh, being tough in, in the face of horrible pain. It's about not being so attached to your design that your ego gets bruised if somebody doesn't like it, right? So that's the grit and resiliency that I get to see on a daily basis. And the other piece of that, the lesson that we learn, is my guys have gotten really good at knowing, oh my gosh, we've just spent 15 minutes talking about the exact shade of red that we're going to use on this button. And honestly, is that the best use of our time? Some of them have started to write into their norms at the beginning of the process that they're going to use rock, paper, scissors to make the decision. They're gonna time box the conversation. If they haven't found consensus, they're gonna do rock, paper, scissors. Whoever wins, that's what they're doing going forward. And it's turned into a thing where they wanna do it every Friday. And so we have a series of trophies. Uh, we just did a spring break project, joint project with the software engineering and platform engineers. And they had heard about it and they wanted uh, rock, paper, scissors off. So we did that at the end of a hackathon point here is find what's important, find what's going to get people home or get people across the finish line.
opportunities to learn, to improve, to go back to school, to get another degree. I can't tell you how many people in my classroom are also getting their master's degrees at the same time. But that idea of continuous learning, because nobody knows everything, even the PM, maybe especially. Nobody knows everything. So we've got to be talking to our stakeholders. We've got to be talking to our users. We've got to be talking to our dads. We've got to be talking to the platform guys about what kind of security issues are going on. What's the pipeline that the things are going through that we may maintain containers? The last thing I wanted to leave you with is a couple of tools for unlearning. Has anyone seen this homunculus before? What it's intended to represent is the nerve endings in our brain and where most of them are connected. And you see it's a lot of them are connected to our tongue because we talk a lot. Some are connected to our eyes, but the most is our hands. And so I encourage my people, if you get stuck, do something with your hands, or as my daughters would say, touch grass. <laughs> right? So we have Play-Doh in our classroom. We have Legos. We have, uh, I have a little toy bag that I take around, and people, people grab toys. I got my little army dudes. Um, because that's going to call on a different part of your brain that's going to shape something and it's not their comfort zone. It's not their comfort zone. It's pushing them into something that feels fresh and maybe a little later. So uh, we've got about three minutes left for Q&A. Uh, some of these toys, I'm keeping. <laughs> but some of these toys are up for grabs. So I would love to share them with anybody who's got a good question. Anybody have a question about the software factory itself? to a point, I can. The software that the soldiers are designing is intended to be used by soldiers. Some of it is, is clerical and administrative. Some of it is for the battlefield. Uh, a couple of examples that they started with were the fact that most technical manuals were in paper. And so digitizing those technical manuals and making sure that people could get them on their mobile devices. Another had to do with counseling soldiers and how sometimes you can't counsel a person face to face, you have to do it virtually. So can you use a QR code or can you use another device that shows I accepted this counseling that I received? Another had to do with sexual harassment training um, and reporting sexual assaults or other unpleasant experiences, uh, illegal experiences. Can you do that through a device in a way that protects, protects your privacy but still gets it up to the right person? Um, yeah, those, those are some things. Prohibits innovation, prohibits novelty, prohibits engagement with the real problem. I assume that part of what you've been trying to do is break that problem in the military. Has it worked? How long is a piece of string? Yes, I would say it has. It has worked with some. I would say there are some legacy.
draw their ideal chair. And with these guys, they usually include a keg. Uh, sometimes the chair part is a toilet, so you don't actually have to uh, There's usually a television uh, involved. And so they sketch this out. We say, thank you very much. That is a beautiful low fidelity prototype. Now you need to build it with pipe cleaners. And I give them pipe cleaners, and they say, oh, well, maybe we can't have this feature any longer because the pipe cleaner doesn't, doesn't bend that way or it's not strong enough to hold it. All right, good job. And now you're going to do it with Play-Doh. And now you're going to do it with chewing gum. And now you're going to do it with toothpicks and popsicle cleaners and a hot glue gun. So that's always fun. But that's the kind of thinking, uh, exercise, designing kind of stuff we do to get them to work with their hands and get out of their heads. One of the big things we say is don't have a meeting with yourself. If I see you looking out the window, you're not doing what I need you to be doing. Stick your hands into that bag of Legos. Stick your hands into it. Start writing something. Do something with your hands. Don't ponder. I don't want to see pondering. That doesn't, that doesn't help us. When's the last time you got a great idea looking at a screen? You got it in the shower, or you got it talking to your four-year-old, or you got it somewhere else. So that's, that's what we try to do. Thank you all.